good morning. Uh, this is our last uh, sermon in the series in the book of Galatians. And I tell you, I'm going to miss that guy ripping on that guitar. I mean, that electric guitar, that is, I just want to get after it. I don't even play the electric guitar, but if I could, I hope I could play like that guy, whoever is playing on the sermon bumper. But go ahead and grab your Bible, join me in Galatians chapter 6. Maybe you didn't catch it. If you didn't, that's, you, you missed out. Um, it's been several weeks. You've had your opportunity. But uh, if you need a Bible this morning, there's one there in the pew. And I would encourage you to go ahead and grab that one. If you need some help finding Galatians chapter 6, it's on page 1034. And I'm so thankful for Dr. Hayward Armstrong for preaching in my absence last Sunday. And uh, also a couple of weeks ago, uh, we haven't been back. We were out last Sunday just away on a family vacation. And um, this is really my first time to communicate to you personally um, just how sweet and special that night was uh, a couple of weeks ago on Sunday night. And so we're so thankful for you. And it's actually been it's a little premature. Our, our 10th year here was officially yesterday. And, uh, and so we've been here 10 years, starting on my next 10 years now. And, uh, and we look forward to those and uh, continuing just to do life with you and to just um, celebrate who God is and um, be a part of what he's doing in the world uh, together. It's, it's a privilege for, for my family and I. And so once again, we just want to say thank you for all your kindness to us. And one of the things that the church gifted me with a couple of weeks ago was is a, is a sabbatical, and um, you've been, some of you, you thought already jumped on that, like last week, I was so tired of you, I just need to get out of here, right? I think that's what some of you thought, but um, I, I don't know when we're going to do that, but we're thankful for it, and uh, I have to search up what do you do on a sabbatical. Once I figure that out, then we'll plan it, and, um, and we'll be away, but we'll make sure you're in good hands when we're gone, and we'll na- make sure that you know it's coming. But, uh, but once again, this morning is our last uh, sermon in the series of the book of Galatians. And uh, so I'm glad you're here. And if this is your first time here, um, the good news is it's, it's really kind of a summary of the book. Uh, this last few verses in this book really kind of emphasize what Paul has been talking about for the several, uh, several weeks that we've been walking through it together as a church. And this book... Um, I think it's special for a number of ways, as is all of Scripture, but one reason it's special is because I believe this is one of the first, Paul's, first letters Paul wrote uh, that we have actually in the New Testament. Uh, some people would, would disagree, but I think it's his earliest letter. And it's so early that it was actually probably penned about 20 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. And so when you think about Christ and Jesus and his death and resurrection, some people would say, well, you know, so many years passed after the resurrection that it was, it became a legend, you know, that there were really no eyewitnesses out there that could confirm that he truly was, you know, was raised from the dead. Well, Galatians stands against that truth because it was written 20 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. And actually, it refers to, in the very first chapter, if you remember, it refers to some creeds and confessions that were probably in place just a few years after the death and resurrection of Christ. And so, we have very good evidence to, to believe and, and be um, assured of our faith in Christ. And um, this letter that was written is one of those reasons we can have such assurance Uh, This letter was written in response to um, some churches that were in danger, churches that Paul planted on his first missionary journey in in this region of Galatia, which would be now modern-day Turkey. And when Paul was met by Jesus on the road to Damascus, he was sent out uh, shortly thereafter. He spent years there in the desert as the Lord was shaping him and teaching him, and then he was sent out on mission. And one of the first places he went was this to these, these regions, and he began sharing the gospel with Jew and Gentile alike. And people were coming to know Christ, and as they were coming to know Christ, churches were being planted. But soon after these churches were planted, they were also being threatened by outsiders that were coming in and and teaching a a false gospel or teaching a distortion to the true gospel. And some of these came in the form of men from Jerusalem who said they were men from James, who was the leader in the church of Jerusalem. And as they arrived there in these churches, they began teaching and undermining the, the, the ministry of Paul. And one of the messages they were sharing, one of the false messages they were sharing to the believers were there, specifically the Gentile believers, were that they had to live like Jews, that they had to follow Jewish customs, that, it, that, that Christ wasn't enough, the gospel wasn't enough, but 
they also had to follow the dietary laws or also had to be circumcised, um, obey the Jewish law. In, in, in summary, they had to become Jews in order to truly be Christians. And so Paul is writing this letter to these churches with the intention to refute this false notion and also that this letter would be circulated amongst the churches. He doesn't um, send this letter to a, very, to a specific church. His hope is that this letter will be circulated amongst the churches in that region. And you see that to be true because in the last chapter, typically in the, in the last chapter of Paul's letters, he would give a share a word of salutation or thanks to um, specific people within the church. Well, Paul doesn't do that here in the last chapter in this letter to the, the book, in, in the book of Galatians. And so, as Paul is writing them, he's encouraging them, challenging them, urging them to once again to be reminded of the true gospel and to get in step with the gospel, to live according to the truth of the gospel. And I think as we read this letter, that has been my hope for you too, because it's so possible for us to, to know the gospel in our heads, but to get out of step with the gospel. To know the, uh, many of you could probably explain to me in your own words what the gospel is, the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, but, but so many of us over time begin to slide into this performance-based religion where we yet say, yes, we believe the gospel in our head, but in our hearts, we don't really believe it. And, and so we, we tend to add our own uh, own notions to the gospel. We tend to add our own effort to the gospel. And tr- instead of trusting in Christ's work, we begin to trust in our own work. And so as Paul is writing this, he's, he's reminding them of the truth. And, and so he's reminding of, us of the truth. And so if you're here this morning and you're going through the routine of church, and you're here this morning and you're, you're not really singing because you desire to sing, because you truly have embraced the gospel, because you truly love God, but you're simply singing because you're just going through the routine, going through the emotion. You're mimicking what other people are singing. Your, your faith is based on a response to other people's faith. The good news is, is listen, God doesn't desire that from you. God doesn't desire for you to just go to, through the routines of religion, just to copy what you see others do. God desires for you to know him personally, for you personally to be in step with the gospel, to live a life that that reflects his goodness and his grace and and that your message is shouting that out to, your life is shouting that out to a world that needs to hear it. And so let's read these words together as Paul concludes this um, letter, starting in verse 11 in chapter 6, he writes these words. He says, look at what large letters I use as I write to you in my own handwriting. Those who want to make a good impression in the flesh are those are the ones who would compel you to be circumcised, but only to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. He's referring to those who've come before him or come after him and try to confuse the believers in the churches. He says, for even the circumcised, these men don't keep the law themselves, and yet they want you to be circumcised in order to boast about your flesh. But as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross and I to the world. For both circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing. What matters instead is a new creation. May peace come to all those who follow this standard and mercy, even to the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble because I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, be with your spirit. Amen. With a letter like this, as, they were, as Paul would write uh, and many others during this time, they would often use a secretary or, or someone else would actually do the physical writing themselves. And so when Paul here in verse chapter 6, when he says, look at what large letters I use as I write to you in my own handwriting, what's, ha- what's taking place here? There's a lot of confusion. What's taking place here is Paul is taking the, the pen from the scribe, and he's beginning to write these words in his own handwriting. And he's using large letters. Today, when you think about making a point and emphasizing something, maybe in a text or an email, what do you do? You use all caps. You, you use bold font. 
Well, what Paul here is doing is he's saying, listen, this is so important. What I'm about to share with you in, in, in the conclusion of this letter is so significant. I'm going to take the pen myself, and I'm going to write this in a way where as, as you can hold it up in front of the entire church, and this would have been a house church, and you can see that this is my handwriting. This is coming straight from me. He's saying, listen to what I'm saying to you. Because listen, if you miss this, you miss everything. And ultimately, in summary of what Paul is saying here in, in chapter 6 can be seen in verse 14. He says, in response to those who've come and, and are boasting in the flesh, boasting in their religious works, and are trying to impress others in response to those things, Paul says these words. He says, but as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross and I to the world. I will boast in nothing except the cross. You know, for, for most of us who've grown up in the church or if you have grown up in the church or you're familiar in some way with Christianity, those words don't really come as a surprise to you. They don't really shock you. But think about the context that Paul is writing in here. I mean, in these days, I mean, we see the significance of the cross because of what it means for us and our faith. But in these days, the cross was seen as, as basically a sign of execution. The Romans would, would crucify the worst kinds of criminals. The, the cross was gruesome. It was horrific. It was a terrible way to die. It was done in a way not only to extract pain, but also to cause shame for the person who is being crucified. A man was, was beaten, stripped of his clothing, nailed to a wooden beam, and then placed along the side of the road so everybody could pass by, could see him and ridicule him and mock him. This was the cross. It was, it was humiliating. And yet, Jesus, that what Paul says here is that same cross that, that brings shame and humiliation to, to so many. It is my boast. It is my boast. What does he mean? What, what does it mean to boast in something? Um, it means that his confidence is in this cross. He emphatically says, listen, I boast in nothing else, only the cross. Our boasting is what our confidence is in, what our hope is in. That's why six months ago, there were no Bengals fans. Nobody liked the Cincinnati Bengals because nobody had hope and confidence. I know one person who liked the Cincinnati Bengals, you know, three months ago. Now, everybody's a Bengals fan. Everybody's boasting in the Bengals. Why? Well, because they've won. They're going to the Super Bowl. They've got confidence in them. That's what, that's what it means to boast in something. You have confidence in that something. And so when Paul says that he is boasting in the cross, one writer said this, boasting is hope that we can hear. He's letting us know where his soul hope is, where his confidence is. And so Paul's sacred boast for his life and his only boast in his life is this, is, and what he, what he means by it is this, is that the only way to experience true freedom in life is through putting your confidence in the cross of Christ. That's what it means when Paul is boasting in the, the, the cross. This is really my, my one point this morning, is that he's saying this, that the only way to experience true freedom in life is through putting your confidence in the cross of Christ. And so with that being said, I would ask you this question this morning. What does the cross of Christ, what place does the cross of Christ have in your life this morning? What place does the cross of Jesus have in your life this morning? Because it meant everything to Paul. It was his one boast. He placed his confidence, his hope in, in nothing else. His, his boast in response to those who were coming to the churches and, and pressuring them to be circumcised, who were, who were seeking to in, in, enforce or uh, the others to, to keep the law. And they were, they were seeking to impress others through boasting in the flesh of others. You see, if these Jewish leaders went to these churches 
and just pretended like circumcision didn't matter, then they would be ostracized by their own community. They would have been persecuted by other Jews who were saying, well, listen, does that, are you denying your Jewish faith? I mean, how can you sit down and eat with uncircumcised Gentiles? And so they would suffer for believing that, that Jesus was enough. And so instead, their desire was to impress other people, impress other Jews. And so with that, they were going to boast in the flesh of these Gentiles by encouraging them, mandating that they be circumcised. And so they were seeking to impress others by boasting in their flesh, boasting in others' flesh. And in doing so, they were cheapening the gospel. They were cheapening the gospel. They were saying, Jesus is not enough. You must also follow Jewish law. And if you cheapen that, when, when you're not willing to suffer for the gospel, you will cheapen it. And we live in a, 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 a church culture today where that's so clear, where everybody says they're a Christian. But when it comes down to either standing true to the gospel having your confidence in the cross or cheapening it, so many people will cheapen it and say there are other ways. They'll distort the gospel. They'll pretend like there's other ways that you can truly be made right with God, as, is, are, as are these Jews coming into these churches. And so they adapted the gospel to their own liking and sought to make others do the same so they could boast in them and make a good impression on others. And the truth is, we all feel this pressure. Uh, There's not a one of us that doesn't feel the need to to make a good impression on other people, to make, when it says to make, to to impress others, it means to make a good showing of your life. All of us inherently feel that desire, don't we? To to be significant in the eyes of others, to to feel worthy, to feel value in the lives of others. Over Christmas Eve, we uh, talked about the movie Orphan Annie and how she was brought into uh, uh, Warbucks home, this millionaire in New York City, the richest man in New York City. And Annie was brought in. She She was living like a slave in this terrible orphanage. And so uh, Warbucks' sister or assistant brings a little orphan into the home. And this is her question. Hey, what do, Annie, what do you want to do first? She's in this immaculate house, two staircases running up to the balcony there in the foyer. And, and she looks down and she says, Annie, what do you want to do first? And Annie's response is, well, first I'll start with the floors and then I'll clean the windows. And she goes on with a list of things she feels like she has to do. And the assistant cuts her off and says, well, you know what, Annie, you don't understand. You don't have to do any cleaning while you are here with us. And Annie's response is this, is, well, how am I going to earn my keep? And all of us are asking that question in this world that, that we find ourselves. We're, we're all seeking to earn our keep, to measure up, to, to, to seek and, and, and find approval in, in someone or something Tim Keller uses another example of this in his book, Encounters with Jesus, and he recounts a scene from a movie featuring one of the great conversationalists of our time, Rocky Balboa. Uh, In Rocky 1, Rocky is having a conversation with his girlfriend, Adrian, and he's talking about the fight. He's getting ready to fight Apollo Creed. Apollo Creed is the undefeated heavyweight champion of the world. And Apollo Creed, in an effort to kind of gain some notoriety for himself, to, to look out for the little man, decides to offer a fight to, um, you know, this, this kind of low-level fighter, part-time boxer, Rocky Balboa, just kind of as a, as a gift to the community. But Apollo Creed plans on knocking him out. Well, Rocky takes the fight, and before the fight, once again, he's talking with his girlfriend, Adrian, and, he, and Rocky explains his mindset, what he's thinking by taking this fight, going into this fight, because no one's giving him a chance. And this is what he says. He says, I just want to prove something. I want to prove that I ain't no bum. Nobody's ever gone 15 rounds with Apollo Creed. If I can, go, if I can give him 15 rounds and that bell rings and I'm still standing, I'm going to know then I weren't just another bum from the neighborhood. And it sounds kind of silly, doesn't it? I mean, but the truth is that that same feeling is in all of us in some way or another. 
There's, this, is, this desire is, is at the heart of humanity. Since the very beginning, since the garden, people have been looking for a place to belong. People have been looking for significance, been looking for value and, and worth as they've been disconnected from God because of our, because of our sin and this broken world that we live in. And, and so we've all been looking for significance. We've all been looking for worth and for value. And, and, and for some, they try to find it in their, their job, their career and, and, and achievement. And for some, it's, it's finding it in a relationship, maybe a, a certain relationship that you either have or you desire to have. For others, it's, it, maybe it's the parent who constantly is trying to measure up and feel worthy through their kids. Even in religion, we can, we can try to measure up and feel acceptable to God and impress this world that we're living in. Even, even through religion, we can so easily take religion and make it bad religion, make it about ourselves, to try to boast in ourselves and, and, and not God. And we can put together our own little checklist of self-righteousness, so once again, so that we can impress others and ultimately feel like we, we matter. We live in a society where people are are pouring themselves out into a thousand different things, trying to improve themselves, trying to make a good showing to others. And all these things, we we seek to measure up, right? We we seek to prove ourselves in some way. These these are our boasts. These are the things that we we think if we can just have or if we can just accomplish or do, then, then, then we can have... Uh, confidence in this world that we live in, confidence in the world and confidence before God. And, and in all these boasts, what Paul is saying, listen, is you can gain worldly status, but you will not gain real life. You will not gain genuine freedom, and you will not gain true peace. You see, these realities can only be found in one place. And Paul would say that's the the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, this morning, for all of you who are just heavy laden, who are worn out trying to be something in this world, trying to be something to God, or maybe you've just kind of thrown in the towel and you're, you're, you're just escaping this world. You've just kind of checked out and you're just going to lay low and, and you've kind of given up. And, and so you're living in some other type of fantasy world where, where maybe just all this stuff doesn't matter. In the same way, you're putting your confidence in, in that. And I would say to you this morning that, that Paul's boast is, is our boast this morning, that the cross offers us a, a way that stands in stark contrast to to the ways of this world, trying to impress this world. It's in, it's in dying to the world. Notice what he says there in verse 14 again, again, he says, but as for me, I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The world has been crucified to me through the cross and I to the world. Paul says, listen, my boast, my confidence is in Christ, and and because my confidence is in Christ, I'm no longer trying to impress the world. The world is is died to me, and I've died to the world. The term world here refers to the the systems of the world, the the world's standards, all the ways that the world seeks to, to lure you in and deceives you into thinking, hey, life is really here. Do this, find life. That, that's the, the systems of the world. This promotion, this, this job, this amount of money, this relationship, living out this fantasy, fantasy, satisfying this physical desire. This is what the world tries to lure you into believing. Hey, put your confidence in me and be satisfied. But the truth is these things don't leave you satisfied. They leave you wounded and broken, thirsty for more, over and over again, wounded and broken and thirsty for more and more. 
guilt and shame upon guilt and shame. And what Paul is saying is, listen, when I placed my faith in Christ, when, when my hope, when my confidence is in the cross of Christ, the world is, is dead to me. The world no longer has a power over me. And the same can be true for you. When you place your faith in Christ, on that cross, the world dies to you. And it, has, it no longer has power over you. And it goes on to say, you are also dead to the world. Not only is, is uh, the world dead to you, but also through the cross, he is dead to the world. You were dead to the world. This past week, we were in uh, Disney World, and uh, we were doing what you do in Disney World, waiting in lines. And um, it's funny because the, the theme throughout Disney World is really just, it's very simple, and it's, it's one thing. It's, it's believe in yourself. Believe in, in the magic. And I, I do, I, I, to a certain extent, I believe there's, there's some value in that, right? To have, uh, I want my kids to have a, a sense of a confidence in themselves when they attempt to do something. I want them to, to believe in themselves to a certain extent, but that message only goes so far, doesn't it? You know, believe in the magic. I didn't feel that magic when I was waiting in line and the ride broke down. Disney, where's the magic there, right? Fix this thing and let's, let's move on with it. But once again, those themes sound good and, and, and those are the kind of things that the, the world tells us, invites us to believe. That it's out there, you can, you can do it. Just keep trying, keep believing in yourself. But eventually, that kind, of, that kind of life will cave in on itself. Listen, we need someone to rescue us from ourselves. We don't need to just put our stock in believing in ourselves. No, we need, we need someone to come in and rescue us from ourselves. I need someone to come in and rescue me from myself. And Paul is saying, this is what Jesus has done on the cross. He has rescued us from, from trying to be good enough for others, for, from, from trying to be good enough from God. Jesus, when we die to ourselves, when we die to this world, we, we die from the system that says that you must perform in, a, in order to be accepted, that you must work, that you must be the best in order to have some kind of worth. We die to the, the systems of this world that says, listen, live for today, live for yourself, do what you want to do. Because my friends, that's not freedom, that's slavery. Paul's sacred boast is that, that real freedom and real life only come through putting your confidence in the cross of Christ. That when you place your faith in Jesus, you are outstretching your arms. And you are placing your arms on his outstretched arms. And the world is dying to you and you are dying to the world. And Paul says that you are a new creation. That it's not about your striving, it's about you trusting and the life and the freedom that you need is not about some outward performance, but it's about an inward change. That only the cross of Jesus Christ can bring about in your life. Through the cross of Jesus Christ, we are, we are justified. We're declared righteous before God. Isn't that what you're looking for? Don't, don't you want to be in right standing with God? Don't you want the approval with God? My friends, it does not come from your performance. It does not come from you creating a checklist, of, a to-do list of walking out of here. You have your promises you're making to God. No, your righteousness 
from God comes from the righteous life that Jesus Christ lived on your behalf and offers you in exchange on the cross as you place your faith in him on that cross. He gives you his righteousness as you give him your sin and you are justified before God. You are declared not guilty before God. Isn't that what you need this morning? Are you tired of trying to be good enough on your own? And then not only are we justified before God, but as a new creation in Christ, we're brought into the, to the home of God. We're adopted as sons and daughters of God. We have a place around his table. He loves you because of Christ. He loves you as his child. When, if you were to walk into God's home, your picture would be on the refrigerator. You are adopted in Christ. You are an adopted child of God. My children don't work to be accepted by me. They're accepted by me because they're my children. In the same way, when you trust in the cross of Christ, when you put your confidence in what Christ has done, you are accepted because you are his child. It's done. And then we're sanctified. In Christ, we're, we're sanctified, right? In, in justification, it's about what God has done. It's in resting in what God has done. In sanctification, it's about fighting to become the person that God has already declared you to be. And then in Christ, there's also glorification. We are glorified in Christ. What does that mean? Well, it means that ultimately... That all that we have become positionally in Christ, when you, when you come to know Christ as your Savior, you are made holy and righteous and blameless. You are forgiven positionally. Well, you're like, well, Andy, I don't feel those things right now. A lot of times I don't feel blameless. I know I'm not holy. Well, throughout your life, sanctification is the process of you becoming who God has already declared you to be. And when you are glorified, one day you will be perfected. When you come face to face with Christ, you will be perfected in Christ. It will be done. As it's already been declared, it's been done. And this is our hope. My friends, that is our boast. Paul writes in verse 16, may peace come to all those who follow this standard. That's the only real pathway for peace for you this morning. It's not by measuring up to the world's standards, but it's by trusting in the standard of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then Paul goes on to end his letter. He writes these words, from now on that no one calls me trouble because I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. What does he mean marks? He means scars. You know what the, the key to Paul's ministry was? He wouldn't, he wouldn't say it's because of his intellect. He wouldn't say it's because of the, the power of his preaching. He was a short man, bald, nothing wrong with that, but he was bald. Supposedly, legend says he even had a crooked nose. You know what the power of Paul's preaching was, his ministry was, his life was, what the secret to it was? It's what he was boasting in, what his confidence was in. Once again, this is probably the, the earliest letter that we have that Paul wrote. And here in this earliest letter, we have the key to his whole life, to his whole ministry. I boast in this one thing, nothing else, the cross of Christ. What place does the cross have in your life? Is it your one boast? Is it where you're finding your significance, your worth? Are you, are you still striving and, and seeking to find it in, in a thousand other things? My friends, I invite you to come and, and rest. Rest by boasting in the cross of Christ. Let's pray together.